All right, we're live. Welcome everybody. This is Wolfram Alderson. I'm CEO of the Hypoglycemia Support Foundation and I'm here with two very distinguished guests. Uh, the first is my cohort, uh, Roberta Ruggiero, who is uh, our founder and president of the Hypoglycemia Support Foundation and has been keeping this organization going for over four decades now. And we're also here with Dr. Keith Berkowitz. He asked us to call him Keith, but we're, uh, we're just in <laughs> awe of Dr. Berkowitz and his work. And at least in terms of the public here, we're gonna keep referring to you as Dr. Berkowitz during this conversation. But as soon as we're offline, we'll, we'll try to be more casual if we can. Uh, but we are so pleased to have you here. And I just wanted to read a little bit about your background so people know who you are if they don't know already but you are the founder and medical director of the Center for Balanced Health in New York City. You specialize in treating metabolic conditions such as obesity, diabetes, thyroid problems, hormone imbalances, and you're on the medical advisory board of the National Foundation of Celiac Awareness, as well as the Hypoglycemia Support Foundation. Uh, you, before founding the Center for Balanced Health, you work closely with Dr. Robert Atkins, and were the medical director of the Atkins Center for Complementary Medicine. Uh, you've previously served in the teaching faculty at North Shore University and New York Uni University School of Medicine. And I know you've been very active in New York City in responding to the pandemic, uh, which today we're calling the dual pandemic of metabolic disease and uh, COVID-19. And as you well know, we're in a in a terrible situation where only 12% of the people in the US are metabolically healthy, and over 50% of the population is either pre-diabetic or diabetic. And so uh, really at the top of our minds today is we are hoping you'll just uh, throw some light onto the relationship between our metabolic health, which of course includes hypoglycemia as one of the leading um, you know, canaries in the coal mine, as we say, um, and also, why, uh, why is, are these conditions affecting folks who may not be obese? Because oftentimes we focus on obesity as a key issue, but uh, we also know that 40% of the normal weight population have metabolic disorders. So we'll stop talking. We'd just love to hear from you <laughs> what your current work is uh, and how you are addressing this dual pandemic of metabolic disease and COVID-19. Thank you so much for having me. It's, it's, I always joke with Roberta, it's my honor to work with her. She has so many year, more years of experience than me in treating reactive hypoglycemia. So I can always learn from her. And so the pandemic, I guess I can start with my story on how I got involved. Please. So, and it's actually interesting that actually there's a book coming out probably in the fall to discuss what happened. So I, I remember in late March, I woke up one evening. I couldn't sleep, actually. It was Wednesday night going into Thursday morning and thinking to myself, we've seen this before, and why are we missing it? So I, I had my staff, since we weren't seeing too many patients anyway, start doing some research and looking to alternative methods. And what I remember seeing is, you know, looking at field medicine. And people are not used to that term, field medicine. We don't work in the armed forces. We're not, you know, out on the front lines. But I remember when my training in the mid 90s in New York City during the really the height of the HIV epidemic. And it turns out that COVID-19 was very similar to something we saw in HIV known as pneumocystis pneumonia. And actually, if you actually took a CAT scan of COVID-19 and put it next to a CAT scan of pneumocystis pneumonia, they look very similar on CAT scan. And they cause this very similar, we call inflammatory process. So if you want, I'll go into how it works. And Please do. Interesting. So I, I think we're very used to learning about viruses, right? Typically, we know about influenza. That's what we've been battling year after year. And influenza is really interesting because it's, and this is a case where the virus really causes the problem. A lot of people get sick. They get sick because of the virus or, you know, they get pneumonias from having a suppressed immune system. And that's what happens. You know, most of us don't get sick. A few get sick, get hospitalized, really, in the more we call immunocompromised population. What's different about COVID-19 is it starts out as a process where the virus really takes over, but within a week later, it causes this extreme inflammatory disease. That's where the, 
the difference is. And again, most people do not get hospitalized from COVID-19 because of the virus, right? You have a fever, some people have a little shortness of breath. It's when that day seven, eight, nine, that the inflammatory process takes over. And we always talk about metabolic syndrome. What people forget about metabolic syndrome or prediabetes or insulin resistance is it's actually a pro-inflammatory state. So you, you match an inflammatory disease with a pro-inflammatory state and we call you have a disaster, right? So you actually have people much more at risk. And if you look at people that actually had gone sick or are getting sick from this pandemic, it's because of the overwhelming inflammation. Their overwhelming inflammation causes in several people what we call a hypercoagulable state. And what that means is the vessels and blood vessels start to become a lot more likely to form clots. And it's these clots that actually lead to people developing respiratory stress and actual blood clots. And especially in the early stage of the disease, or I'm sorry, the early days of the disease, this is what led people to be on a ventilator or actually in the end, you know, pass away or die. So people with underlying metabolic condition already have that increased risk, right? We talk about metabolic disease as a risk factor for heart disease, you know, for cancer. Those are highly what we call pro-inflammatory conditions. And if you look at the data of what people who have really suffered from this pandemic more than any other group, it's the people with this metabolic disease or with, you know, um, a, what we call a pro-inflammatory state already. Does this, so to, oh, sorry, I'm sorry, go ahead. Does this inflammatory state have something to do with what I've heard about the cytokine storm? Correct. Uh, so cy cytokine storm is the, re cytokines are the chemicals or hormones that are secreted when the body wants to fight inflammation. So inflammation is interesting. You want inflammation, right? You stub your toe, you cut your wrist, and then you want it to heal. So the way it heals, it actually forms a scar, right? So that's all that inflammatory cells get there to work on the healing process. What you don't want is the inflammatory process to overrun the body. That's where the key is. So that, that's a, what we call a cytokine storm or a runaway inflammatory disease. And often we see that by certain measures in the blood. We've talked about before C-reactive protein, for example, high ferritin levels. Uh, when we look at blood clots, it's actually a marker called D-dimer. So these are clear markers where people who are at higher risk will end up with more complications from this pro-inflammatory state or, you know, term cytokine storm. And what, what does blood sugar have to do with this? I mean, we, one of the challenges we face with hypoglycemia, as Roberta well knows, is that, uh, you know, hypoglycemia is associated with so many kinds of disorders. There's acute forms, chronic forms diet-related forms, uh, forms of hypoglycemia related to various medical issues. Can you just help us all understand, get some, some basic understanding of blood sugar health and hypoglycemia? That includes, you know, not just low blood sugar, but high blood sugar. I think there's a lot of confusion about that. Why, why, how can we have both? And what's the relationship? That's a great question. So I, I think you have to really define what, and I use the term reactive hypoglycemia, you have to define what it really means. And, and in my mind, and this is what I think of, it's what we call an insulin resistance syndrome. And what that means is that the body, in response to glucose load, sends a signal to the pancreas that says, hey, I got all this glucose here. I need to move it into cell. I need to make insulin. Insulin is that, is that hormone that works on actually transporting glucose and other macronutrients into the cell. What insulin resistance means is that it takes so much more insulin to do the job. So if you think about prediabetes or high blood sugar, it's the same process. The early stages of that disease is where you have so much more insulin production. The main difference, and I think where people get confused, in, in reactive hypoglycemia, you can have normal insulin levels, but still be insulin resistant. And the reason is, you have to look at that insulin level in relationship to that glucose level. And what that means is, you can have a low glucose level and have normal insulin, and that's a relatively inappropriate amount of insulin for the body to make. And what happens because of that is it takes that insulin, because it's driving glucose into the cell, takes that glucose and drops it too low. So that's the term reactive hypoglycemia in response to. It's a response, a glucose in response to stress of food where your blood sugar ends up dropping because of the inappropriate amount of insulin secretion. 
And people forget reactive hypoglycemia really is a pre-diabetic condition. And often the condition where people actually feel years in advance before developing diabetes, I think that's really key. And I think because of that, it's so underdiagnosed. So Dr. Keith, um, I love that. <laughs> I, I, would assume, I, would assume, I, I would assume that you're suggesting or highly suggest that when someone goes to a doctor, not only are they tested for their blood glucose, but insulin is extremely important, that that should be tested also. A hundred percent. I really believe, and I think there's a lot of my colleagues that think the same way, that really the disease of hypoglycemia or reactive hypoglycemia is really a disease of blood sugar dysregulation. And the main driver of that blood sugar dysregulation is insulin. And so it's that inappropriate amount of insulin. Where we get into trouble and where we often miss it is when you go into the doctor, you have labs that are fasting. You have a fasting glucose, they may do a fasting insulin. They could both be normal. Because reactive hypoglycemia itself is actually a process of glucose response to a stress. So measuring that fasting level may not be diagnostic and may miss what we're looking for. And again, without insulin, you're not going to know really if that glucose level and insulin level are what we call in sync. So where, Dr. Berkowitz, does, does this leave the patient? I mean, so if most of the doctors or those that recognize or test or treat hypoglycemia are only testing and treating due to their glucose, that they're testing with the glucose tolerance test or the continuous glucose monitor, which is now, you know, more and more doctors are using. What happens if, if they get lost and they're not being tested for this insulin? Do they go and say, oh, I heard Dr. Keith Berker was talking about insulin. I want my insulin tested. So even if they did, I mean, do these doctors understand? I mean, so where are these patients? In New York, I joke in New York, they do because they listen, they have no choice patients are good at, at saying that. But what it is, is actually, you know, there's, there's two problems with that. And so when you think of hypoglycemia, the, one of the main issues is you can't make a diagnosis on one data point, right? Because it's a reaction to, to, to make a diagnosis of a reaction to, you need two data points, right? You have your starting point and then a reaction to the stress or the food, your blood sugar goes down. So measuring one glucose level in itself probably is not that helpful. Okay, and actually in reactive hypoglycemia, oftentimes that fasting glucose level is normal. One of the key caveats of that, and I always think of is, typically you would think of your fasting glucose should be your lowest glucose of the day. And so people with reactive hypoglycemia who have a glucose level after that, that's lower than that fasting state, should really work towards making that diagnosis or making it better. So I think, you know, we talk about you know, sometimes helpful is the continuous glucose monitor where you get multiple data points and you can also test with the stress, right? So you know how we diagnose heart disease, right? You do a stress test. You could be fine when you're sitting down, when you start exercising, exerting yourself, that's a problem. So reactive hypoglycemia, it's very much the same issue. You could be fine when you're sitting first thing in the morning, when you go to exert yourself or your body's under stress, whether it's exercise, whether it's food, whether it's someone calling you on the telephone or your family, that's the reaction. You want to see what that glucose is after that reaction. And that's really critical. So you want to see both the glucose and insulin after, you know, kind of a stress. Whether the stress is food, we, we do it two ways. We do either a food challenge or a glucose challenge. Could you describe the, the continuous glucose monitor technology a little more? I know you've integrated it into your PAC practice. Uh, and expanded it beyond the, you know, the use for years has been with type 1 diabetics. And their Correct. use of the technology is different than the use for people who are pre-diabetic or diabetic. Um, they, they may need at some points uh, some crackers and juice uh, to, to, to get the blood sugar back up. Um, but we're seeing the use of the continuous glucose monitor expanding and um, I, I think a lot of people are wondering, how do I get access to a glucose monitor, a, a continuous glucose monitor? And then, um, the, as you probably are aware, the, the apps that are designed for people to use these monitors are still really pretty much designed for type 1 diabetics. So how do people read this information sure. and, and you know, sort of get a, 
a picture and, and the, as I understand it, the continuous glucose monitor is like a moving picture. You're getting not just the snapshot, as you said, but you're getting this uh, moving picture over time. And how do we, how do we, how does the average person out there know what to look for and then communicate with their doctor? I think there's some versions of the app where the doctor can actually monitor the data as well like the Abbott freestyle. Right, so, so you can you could check into, it goes to a, a cloud-based website you can do, and I have cloud. So you need a prescription from a doctor, first of all, and typically they, they have readers that last 14 days. That's the most typical pattern. The real advantage to that is really you're looking at multiple data points. I think one of the people's biggest frustrations, especially reactive hypoglycemia, is what are the triggers, right? So you, by identifying the triggers, you can really make lifestyle adaptions eating or other things to really, you know, deal with that. You know, the interesting thing about blood sugar, and I think this is the mistake that people make. So, and we know this basically from diabetics, people who have a rise in their blood sugar, say the blood sugar is 200, they really don't often feel symptoms from that, right? You can walk around with blood sugar two to 300, you don't feel symptoms. But in people that suffer from reactive hypoglycemia, a drop from 120 to 80, could be incredibly symptomatic where they get dizzy or lightheaded. And I always kind of use the term, it's almost like a panic state on the body. Think about if you feel worse after you eat, right, where you have a low blood sugar, that's like going to a gas station to fill your car with gas and there's a hole in the bottom of the tank. So what happens is that drop in blood sugar is so much more symptomatic oftentimes compared to the rise in blood sugar. And I think, you know, I feel so honored that you guys go attention because it's so much in its early stages can be a very severe you know, condition and very debilitating. This is a, such an important point you're bringing up is, uh, for people that may not know, you, uh, explain what the normal range of blood sugar is, what the threshold is for low blood sugar, and why some people might experience profound symptoms of low blood sugar while still being in the normal range. Great question. So I always think about what's normal. Who, who is it based on? Do they find 10 people? And say, okay, here's your normal blood sugar. So two things, and, and it, this is the difference, and this could differ dramatically. So some people are used to what we call very tight control, where they live in a very small range, could be 20, 30 points, where others can live in a range of two to 300 points of blood sugar. I mean, we typically measure, we call it hemoglobin A1C, right, which is a three-month marker. It's a, a marker on red blood cells which live 90 days that gives you an average of your blood sugars over 90 days. So two people can have the same number, but have very different patterns. One number could be based on a, a range of 40, 50 points. One number could be based on a range of 200 points. So let me give you an example. So you can have someone that wakes up in the morning with a blood sugar of 90, right? Eats, goes up to 110, and then they get this overwhelming insulin response or inappropriate insulin response, and they drop to 70. That drop to 70 can be extremely symptomatic. Or even for some people that drop to 80, it really depends what your body's used to. And you know what we've learned from this? And I, I think people forget. We learned this from strokes. People come into the hospital with a stroke, right? And it's often from high blood pressure. So we learned that the blood pressure may be 200. You don't want to lower that blood pressure down to 120 if they're used to a blood pressure of 160. That can actually cause another stroke. So you have to kind of, and that's where the uh, continuous glucose monitor really helps. You can get a lot of data points and say, where do I live? Where do I feel the most comfortable? And I think what, what people don't realize, symptoms from reactive hypoglycemia don't happen from the blood sugar. They happen from the adrenaline or cortisol response in response to that low blood sugar. Low blood sugar itself does not cause symptoms. It's the body's inability to compensate for that and requirement to, to produce what we call these stress hormones that causes a lot of the symptoms that people get. Back to Roberta's point, how, how, do you, how does the patient ask the intelligent questions to get the proper diagnosis you know first of all are they talking you know should they be talking to their general practitioner or should they be looking to talk to a endocrinologist uh you know what kind of doctor should they be talking to and then what questions can they bring up and how can they prepare for that conversation you know we have something called the diet symptom diary which even if you don't have a continuous glucose monitor you can track uh, what you eat and how you feel in relation to what you eat. I think that is such a critical first point. And I think the mistake is our natural inclination as a healthcare professional is to do labs when we're fasting. 
So what you need really first to communicate is, I'm fine when I wake up in the morning. It's at this time. So maybe the key is have your labs drawn at that time. So if you feel typically bad at 11 a.m., have your labs drawn at 11 a.m. Try and mimic the symptoms as best as possible. Because once you show those results, and the results being out of range at that point, and you probably have a comparison point elsewhere, that helps tremendously. I, I think the problem is, is there's a discordance between symptoms and testing. And what it means by that, and you said this before, if you're testing at 8 a.m., but your symptoms are at noon, that doesn't help you, right? So the testing is going to be, oh, you're perfect. You look great on paper. You're fine. Uh, that's my biggest source of patience, by the way. <laughs> but again, if you say, okay, my symptoms are after I eat at nine, I have symptoms at 11, you should tell your healthcare professional, I want to do my blood work at 11 after I have my normal breakfast. So I can see what's my response to that. And so you can actually capture when you're not feeling good. And I think that's why I love continuous glucose monitor, which you can do that. You can say, okay, what's my blood sugar at 11 a.m. when I'm not feeling good? What's my blood sugar at 1 p.m. when I am feeling good? That's, those are the things you want to know. You want to know both. And that way you can establish a range where you should be the most comfortable with. Dr. Berkowitz, I just found out recently after listening to you the last year or so. So, well, I guess that's not recently then. <laughs> <laughs> it's all relative. <laughs> the correlation between hypoglycemia and the thyroid. I mean, I've been studying hypoglycemia for over 40 years. First, as you know, because of my personal story and because I had it for so long and was misdiagnosed or undiagnosed. And then since I founded the organization almost 40 years ago, never once in all those years have I read about, have, was I ever told, did I ever know about the correlation until you mentioned it very casually about a year and a half ago. And I think every time we speak, I try to get a little bit more from you, you know, because <laughs> it, it's really, um, it's fascinating, but it's complicated. And since I have both, sometimes I wonder the people that are out there that are just looking at their diet, what they eat, what they drink, and they say, well, I'm on the perfect diet, I'm not cheating. You know, they don't realize that it could be another medical condition that they're not even aware of, like the thyroid and the role that it plays. So I think you really uh, have something to share with us, and I can't wait to hear it. Okay, sure. Thank you. Boy, time is, is weird these days, right? It could be a day or a month. It, it's not clear. It's like one long day, actually. So one of the things that people think about is, you know, oftentimes we forget that conditions can cross several categories, right? Even within the endocrine system, you can have issues with your thyroid, you can have issues with your blood sugar. And now as we see the, especially underactive thyroid or autoimmune thyroid is becoming so much more common today. It's if we look at all the autoimmune diseases, and there's probably about 70, 80 million people in this country with an autoimmune disease, the most common is Hashimoto's thyroiditis or autoimmune thyroid. What people forget is the thyroid really works as your stress hormone or mother hormone. It's, it has to respond to, to stress. So when you look at blood sugar, we forget that blood glucose is one of our biggest sources of stress, right? So when our blood sugar is low, we have to respond to raise that blood sugar up. The problem in people with an underactive thyroid, they have a lot more trouble regulating their blood sugar. And the mechanisms are a couple. One of the main ones is they have a lot more trouble taking protein, for example, and clearing it into glucose, a process in our liver called gluconeogenesis, which allows us to adapt to a low blood sugar state by saying, okay, there's not enough carbohydrates there, let's take protein. And people forget protein, 40, 50% of protein can be converted into glucose as energy. So because they can't react to that, their body goes into a much greater panic state. And again, we, and I was mentioning before, the symptoms from reactive hypoglycemia don't come from the low blood sugar. They come from the blood sugar's cause to cause an adrenaline and cortisol response. That's what happens. So people with a combination of underactive thyroid or hypothyroid and reactive hypoglycemia have so much more trouble regulating their blood sugar and will end up having a much greater you know, adrenaline and cortisol response, anxiety, sweating, palpitations, difficulty sleeping. I actually was going through your um, forum on Facebook and I saw the majority of people actually have the combination of the two. 
And what people don't realize about thyroid also is about 50% of people are undiagnosed. So a lot of people are walking around with an underactive thyroid and don't even know about it. So if you could be walking around with two conditions, right? An undiagnosed reactive hypoglycemia and an undose, undiagnosed underactive thyroid. The other way that thyroid affects blood sugar regulation is thyroid has a big impact on what we call motility and what we call gastrointestinal motility, which means it has the controls the way things pass through our digestive tract. So one of the issues that happens in reactive hypoglycemia is when we eat food, the body senses glucose and says, okay, let's get the pancreas working. Let's make some insulin. But if that food is delayed to get to where the insulin is being secreted, what ends up happening is you have excess insulin coming out of the system into the bloodstream without the glucose to match it. And people often get much more severe hypoglycemic symptoms because of their digestive issues. So again, we think of, and Roberta, we've talked about this before, one of the symptoms of hypothyroid is constipation or gas and bloating often come with that. So you're going to have both a mechanism of not being able to convert protein into glucose as quickly when you have those hypoglycemic or, you know, I almost call it a panic state. And as well, when you are eating food to try and compensate because of the transit time of food being delayed. So both of those cause issues, and it's really important. So the other aspect, and, and this is what I've learned over the years, and Dr. Atkins helped me a lot with understanding this, is that people then with hypoglycemia cannot decrease their carbohydrate intake as low as others. So they become more dependent on having more carbohydrates than the other population because they have more challenges in actually accessing glucose than, than people who don't have issues with the thyroid. Dr. Berkowitz, you've, you've mentioned uh, Dr. Dr. Atkins, and we've been talking mostly about diagnosing and treating the, the problem or problems, but um, we also need to talk about you know, the co what's upstream of this, what's causing <laughs> these problems. Now, of course, um, like as I said, hypoglycemia is associated with almost every major medical condition. So there could be a, a medical condition that's a precursor, an organ or a system just isn't functioning properly. Um, but I think for the majority of people that we talk to, um, the issue is diet related. It's something that's really preventable or something that can be changed. Um, but um, there's just, as you know, the world of nutrition and the information we get just seems to be mind boggling. And we hear different things uh, every, every day. Butter's good, butter's bad, you know, ketogenic diets. Uh, it's just, you know, really hard for people to to understand. We are actually uh, involved in pioneering a technology, uh, it's called Perfect, that will uh, provide, create a, a filter so people can filter the entire food supply. And just, just one ingredient, sugar, filters out 75% of all products on the shelf. So maybe you could just tell us, um, you know, from your perspective, what is, of course, getting proper treatment, get finding a doctor who understands this stuff and can understands the correct protocols and really knows what to look for. That's key. But what can we do just right now before I even see a doctor, you know, what can we do to change? What are some of the key things we can do to change our diet or our lifestyle? Um, you mentioned stress, you know, what are some of the key things we can do to just prevent ourselves from having to go to doctor in the first place? So I always think about what do we control the most, right? What do we have most control over? And there's a couple of things, right? We control what we put into our bodies, which is food or a liquid. We control whether we sleep or not sleep, to some degree, and we control how our body functions. Do we rest? Do we exercise? Do we walk? So we can actually utilize several of those things. So, and let me, actually, let me make one more comment about hypothyroid. So I, almost every case I've seen of hypothyroid or underactive thyroid has reactive hypothyroidemia. They go hand in hand. Wow. So getting back to, it's amazing, right? It's all tied together. I, 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 that's mind boggling. Say that again, please. <laughs> so every case I've ever seen of underactive thyroid also has components of reactive hypoglycemia. Wow. Big clue to follow up on there. <laughs> <laughs> oh my so God. let me start with the most basic one, sleep, right? Yeah, that's one that we don't use a lot of, although hopefully in this pandemic, we're using more of it. You know, our body needs to repair and restore. And that's the key. So proper sleep is so critical. If you look at all the studies on longevity, one of the things they talk about is the body's ability to repair and restore overnight. 
you know, always like the factory model, right? At the end, Amazon excluded. At the end of the day, they turn the factory off, right? The machines get to rest, the cool down, and then the next day they restart it, right? When we were growing up, we would finish food eating by six o'clock and we wouldn't eat again till eight o'clock. So actually allowing the body to rest is so critical. And where we kind of fall off on that is actually we, one of the things we do is we eat too late. So oftentimes we're, because our digestion is now problematic, we see that among a lot of people, is we're digesting while we're sleeping. If you're digesting while you're sleeping, you're really not resting. And interesting enough, people who suffer from symptoms, for example, of waking up in the middle of the night to urinate, and my favorite hypoglycemic or reactive hypoglycemic, vivid or dreams or nightmares, which is very typical, that is problematic because your body's digesting and then two or three o'clock in the morning, it's finished digesting, your blood sugar's dropped, and now you're symptomatic again. If you finish digesting by eight or nine o'clock, then your body gets to cool down. Cortisol gets the drop. You were mentioning before about stress. People forget that blood sugar is a response to two different things. It's a response to stress, which comes from cortisol, 50%. And the reason we know that, we know this from studies of diabetics who are on insulin, that when they undergo surgery, even though they're not eating, they still need half the dose of insulin. Or number two, the food we eat. So by downregulating both of those, it allows our body to cool down and actually rest better. That's a lot, I know we hear about intermittent fasting. I always laugh about intermittent fasting. That's what we always did. <laughs> it's not new, right? When we grew up, we finished dinner by six o'clock. We didn't eat till eight o'clock. I remember my mom saying, the kitchen is now closed. Leave. So you had 14 hours without eating, right? That's intermittent fasting. So that's really critical, number one. Number two is actually the foods we choose and when we choose them, right? People especially, you want carbs to be really more likely to be around when, you are, when your energy needs it, right? It's like gas. You don't need a lot of carbs before you go to bed. You need them more early in the day. And also from that same aspect, food combining is really important where you have things with protein and fat. Because remember, one of the key points of stabilizing blood sugar is fat. Fat actually helps regulate our blood sugar. A much smaller percentage of fat becomes glucose, so around 10% than protein or carbohydrates. And having them together and food combining is a very effective way. I added something for the pandemic now. So what I've done for the pandemic is I have people go have a walk after dinner. So what that really helps, number one is you don't eat as much, right? Because you know you're walking. Number two is you actually facilitate your digestion by moving. So by getting up and moving and standing up, and you're actually going to help your digestion occur quicker so that you complete that process by the time you go to bed. I, I think where, where hypoglycemia is so more challenging today, I should use the term reactive hypoglycemia, than when I did my training with Dr. Atkins, is the role of digestion. Digestion is really, as food, and you said, as food has changed, as food has become more processed, as fiber has left natural foods, as our digestion and bacterial issues have occurred, digestion is slower. And that makes it so much more difficult to control and regulate your blood sugar. And one of the things I stress a lot of times is to have foods, what we call that are easily digestible. So especially when you start the day and you know you're gonna get symptoms from low blood sugar after breakfast, try and think of foods that are not only balanced, but foods that are actually easily absorbed so that you can stabilize your blood sugar in the morning before you, before you start your day. We've actually heard from some of our uh, members of our community. They said, well, I, I've figured it out. Uh, whenever my blood sugar drops, I just take some resistant starch. Uh, you know, it sort of sounds along the lines of just have some crackers and orange juice. What is the problem with that? We know that Certainly in an acute form of hypoglycemia, you may need to do whatever it takes to get your blood sugar back up because it, it feels like you're, you're gonna pass out or, or worse. Uh, so, and, and so that may be a, a, a good solution for an acute manifestation, but why, uh, what about this idea of taking starch throughout the day, just you know, constantly feeding yourself with more uh, carbohydrate? So it's so interesting. So let's take a step back. What is reactive hypoglycemia? And, and I, want, I always use this, and I think it helps people understand. To me, it's an overactive state, right? It's your body going up in glucose, up in insulin, down in glucose, up and down. And what people don't realize, the more up and down you have, the overall more insulin your body makes. Insulin's like the villain. You know, we talk about inflammation. 
probably one of the number one inflammation markers in our body is insulin. So the last thing you want to do is have more insulin produced, right? It's a fat storing hormone. It's linked to heart disease, linked to cancer, linked to, you know, other diseases. So you don't want that. So I think by, by doing something like resistant starch, the danger is you only delay in the symptoms. You're not solving the problem. I look almost the other way. You want to, and people laugh, especially people who have gained weight. I want the body to slow down. And they're like looking at me like, wait a second, I'm carrying extra weight. Should I move faster? But it's actually the opposite. You actually want the body to be more efficient. You want it to slow down. It's like driving a car. You want to take your foot off the gas and the brake. You want to be on cruise control. Because by doing that, the body is actually much better regulated. That's the key at the end of the day. That's what our goal is. By regulating the body better, we do better. And I tend to avoid foods that are really temporary Band-Aids or fixes. What I like a lot in the morning is doing things like shakes and stuff. I'll use something like berries with avocado and maybe a non-dairy milk and mix it together. So something that's easily absorbed and can control blood sugar. So one of the key things about blood sugar, and if I can talk about food for a second, Please. is fiber can be effective. But fiber is effective in a different way than people understand. So resistant starch, there's some fiber aspects to it, right? We talk about fiber traditionally has always been thought of being mixed with water, right? We have cereal and milk, other, other ways, or fiber and fruits. But fiber actually likes fat. So when we mix, for example, avocado is a great example. Avocado is one of the best foods out there for controlling your blood sugar. When fiber is blended with fat appropriately, that's why I like roasting vegetables instead of raw vegetables, another example, is it actually is a much better blood sugar stabilizer. For the reason is, fiber then is not taking water out of your digestive tract. What people forget with diabetes, and again, reactive hypoglycemia is, is in that diabetic family, is one of the key problems regulating your blood sugar is when you get dehydrated. So when the body gets dehydrated, blood sugar will rise. The cells have a lot more trouble handling glucose. Great example, when a, a person comes into the emergency room with a blood sugar of 500, the first treatment is actually not insulin. The first treatment is actually intravenous fluid. So by restoring and balancing fluid, that's really critical. So you want to focus on foods that don't impact that fluid balance. That is so critical to, to doing that. And one way actually, and I do this diagnostically in people that have reactive hypoglycemia, one of the first things I do in the office, especially people that get lightheaded, is I do what we call orthostatic blood pressure and pulse. I think you got frozen for a minute. Yeah. Well, um, I, I think uh, on our end, we're, we're okay, but maybe his connection is uh, right. we'll a little problematic. So uh, at least until he reconnects, we can uh, try to fill the, sp the giant space between what Dr. Berkowitz is saying and what we're doing. Um, it's, it's, he's just phenomenal. I mean, he's such a wealth of information and the way he explains it that you can understand, you can comprehend, and I can't wait to share this, well, with everyone, but particularly with our HSF community. So, um, you know, I'm very, very excited. Hopefully he'll come back. What I did want to ask Dr. Berkowitz, if we have a chance and maybe not today, then maybe next week, the role stress is playing. I mean, we're experiencing, uh, you know, um, in our lifetime, what I don't think many people ever have, uh, you know, with COVID-19 and people with isolation. So I wanted to ask him, um, you know, some extra suggestions that, you know, our community can do. What, again, what everybody can do. So I'm hoping that he could come back. Well, I wanted to just f uh, follow up a little bit again, while um, hopefully he'll reconnect, but to recap what he was saying, you know, we talked about the diet symptom diary and tracking symptoms related to food. Um, he talked about the continuous glucose monitor. And um, I, I, I can say from personal experience that it, um, my, my doctor was, uh, didn't bring it up herself, but I, when I brought up the idea of using a continuous glucose monitor, uh, she was willing to write the prescription since I was at the time borderline um, diabetic. Um, and so th that's another thing that people uh, can do. Uh, he talked about 
you know, certain dietary changes that we can make. And we have um, uh, lots of information on our website regarding diet as well as diagnosis. Um, and on the diet front, we, we are testing this perfect technology to allow people to filter the food supply, become more aware of substances like added sugar um, that, are, that are in most of the food supply. And we have a, a page on our website, people can sign up and uh, try out a preview of that technology before it um, goes live. So there's a number of things people can do and a lot of these resources on our website. And certainly when we post this interview, uh, we will share these resources and uh, ways to reach uh, Dr. Berkowitz. Um, there he is. <laughs> oh, there he is. Great. Talk about that. Oh my God. I, we're having a storm here. That's why I think it's happening. So which okay. part, you want to start again that statement? Yeah. And we, we were just recapping what you were saying while we figured <laughs> that you would be back. So um, we're very excited. I, I just, um, I'm in awe about what you say and it, it's just incredible. It, it, we don't get this from anybody else. So we're just so proud and honored that you're sharing it with us. I was just ask, um, sharing with Wolfram that uh, we're in unprecedented times, especially with the COVID-19. I know we touched on it at the beginning. Um, people are now in isolation. They're frightened. They're scared. They're really not eating the food that you know they're supposed to eat, even if they want to eat. I know when I first went out to um, get some of my food, there were no vegetables. There was hardly any meat. Now it's coming back. We have more meat. We have more vegetables. But uh, stress is playing a major role on everybody. How is it affecting those with hypoglycemia or with diabetes or any blood sugar problem? Oh, I think it's really problematic. I think what's interesting of stress is about 50% of what drives your blood sugar. So again, so when you're having more and more cortisol, that, that's going to cause more and more glucose. And what people don't also realize, cortisol also has other impacts. It can mess with your sex hormones. It can affect in women menstrual cycles. It can affect sleep. I think people are having more caffeine and alcohol, so it's impacting sleep. I was mentioning before, one of the things I'm making my clients do is walk after dinner. So they're not having that big meal at night. Because often people with reactive hypoglycemia, a big meal is almost like putting you know, wood on a, on a burning fire. It's making it worse and worse. So the symptoms become more apparent. And I think it's really what people do the best. And I think what's really important is structure is always important. We're very routine oriented people, right? Individuals, we like routine. So the more we create structure, especially in these very uncertain times, the better we do where we get up at a certain time, where we continue our exercise, where we do the things we enjoy, meditation, prayer, reading, all those things are really critical so that our body continues doing those routine actions that we have made us successful. And no matter what, they could change. Like for example, I'm used to going to the gym at 5.30 in the morning. So now it's my morning walk. So I'll walk to the supermarket. And the great thing about that, if I'm walking, I can't carry any many bags back. <laughs> And the great thing is vegetables are lighter than cans. So, so doing things like that, you have to adapt around that so that your body can survive. It's really important. I mean, you know, where people have the hardest time I find in practice is when uncertainty or the unknown. So the more you move away from that, the better you will do. I've noticed Dr. Berkowitz, uh, uh, we are ordering more uh, online uh, than we did before. I sure. I think the statistics show a lot of people are ordering more things online than ever before. And I find that there's an upside to that, which is, um, as you know, when you're in the supermarket or Whole Foods, there's all these tempting uh, foods. And uh, I'm not walking up and down the aisles. I'm not standing in the checkout aisle with the, uh, you know, the uh, candy bars and the chocolate and all that other stuff that's in the, the high energy drinks uh, right before you get up to the cashier. Uh, the impulse buying section. Sure. Um, and um, also when I buy things on, you know, uh, online, they, they remember some of the things I purchased before. And so there's sort of patterns that get set there. Um, and uh, so I've, I've noticed that we're eating even less of the impulse foods. And I mean, there, there's an upside to this, uh, which is one reason why we're excited about this perfect technology is being able to filter the entire food supply in case you, you, you're not aware of what kinds of sugars are out there because there's actually 
several hundred names for sugar and it's in 75% of the food supply. And then we have the next level, which is processed carbohydrates. And they're finding ways through the processing to actually increase the sugar levels in the food through the processing. For example, you mentioned non-dairy milk. So there's a particular type of uh, oat milk where they say no, at, they, they were saying no added sugar on the label, but then they were required to change that because they found out that during the processing, they were malting uh, the right. oats and to increase the sugar levels. And so it was just like adding sugar, but essentially um, it was just through the processing. So as you know, there's a lot of tricks out there. Um, you know, I find the most interesting of that is you look at organic products and I think people buy things that are organic and you'll see cane sugar is the first ingredient or my favorite organic corn syrup. That one, I still don't understand. <laughs> you can buy, and again, that's what's amazing. And I think you're so right about one thing. The, the, the advantage to people in the pandemic is you can eat at home. When you prepare foods at home, you know exactly what you're putting into your body. When you're eating out, you really don't have that same access. You don't know what they're adding. And again, oftentimes people cook without following a recipe, so it could be different each time you eat. So that's really advantageous. So I've, the people I've seen really do well I've taken advantage of that where they are eating. And one of the things, and going back to food, is I think people do better when their bigger meal is during the day and a smaller meal at night, when their body really matches their energy needs and demands. Dr. Berkowitz, you mentioned cortisol. So does mm -hmm. that mean when you go to the doctor and you're getting your blood sugar tested, now you should get your insulin tested, should you also get your cortisol tested? That's a great question. So the problem is cortisol testing in the blood is, is also a little bit inaccurate. Remember, if you're not in a stressed state, you may not see an elevated cortisol. And the other problem with even drawing any bloods is if it's your first data point, you don't know where you were before. Better ways of measuring cortisol are actually these 24-hour tests, where we're doing what we call saliva testing. So what we're doing over a 24-hour period, measuring four different cortisol times, once in the morning around noon, noontime, you know, late in the afternoon and also at bedtime to see that cortisol pattern. And where people have the most issues are people that have either low cortisol in the morning where they've developed long-term fatigue or an inappropriately high cortisol at night, which is affecting their sleep. I think especially the nighttime cortisol is really problematic, especially this time of, with the pandemic, people are staying up later and later. You know, they're binge watching on TV or something else and they're not sleeping properly, and that's gonna affect their blood sugar. The body likes routine, and it also likes to follow what we call circadian rhythm. It's dark for a reason. You wanna sleep when it's dark, you wanna wake up when it's light. So just you know, from a lay person standpoint of view, to control your blood sugar and your insulin would be mostly diet, but to control your cortisol, does diet Proper play sleep, a role? Watching, or ca watching caffeine intake, watching alcohol, Okay. you know, using ways to control stress. I mean, stress is such an interesting thing because again, glucose, you get a number, right? You know, your glucose is 90 or 100 or 110. There's no number that says my stress is 11 today. It's a seven, it's a six, right? So it's a lot harder to kind of think about, but it's so much more important because it really plays about a 50% role. I, I always think of food being half the battle and stress being the other half. And I think in a lot of ways, the harder part is the stress part because it's not always apparent to people. You, you know, we have a lot of chronic stress. We get used to it. This is normal. So we may not realize that we're stressed and because our day-to-day -day life has been this way for a long time. But it actually may be what we call a chronic stress state or hype stress state or caffeine or alcohol or other things we do to manage our day-to-day. -day. Dr. Berkowitz, um I'm, I'm sure you're aware of this, of the movement, uh, the, the mindfulness meditation movement and uh, the mindfulness-based stress reduction has uh, creeped its way into hospitals across the U.S. Um, what is your experience with integrating meditation uh, into your practice of helping people deal with stress? I found it's enormously helpful for me to have a practice, to have some yes. tools, to have... Uh, I attend a weekly meditation group, and it just puts uh, it puts this stress management on my literally on my calendar, and it's given me uh, some tools that 
you know, there's just so much to learn in that world. I'm just curious how that's integrating with your, uh, at the Center for Balanced Health. Sure. I mean, or oral daily practice, right? So I always like the, the term. It's like going to fix your plumbing and you leave your toolkit at home, right? So you're not going to get too far. So where it plays a difference? Again, let's, I, I like put it into terms of reactive hypoglycemia. So if we think of reactive hypoglycemia as this overheated state, right? Your body's an overheated. You want to do things to lower that down, right? If your body's more efficient and not working as hard, guess what happens? You don't need as much glucose, right? Then you don't make as much insulin you don't want to have as much blood sugar dysregularity. So doing things like mindfulness can help that. So it takes the cortisol part of reactive hypoglycemia off the page. And again, there's so many different methods. You can use meditation. I like one called a form of biofeedback that's called coherence that teaches you to get your breathing and heart rate in sync. And if you actually watch that, blood pressure drops in that, sleep gets better. You know, your overall health gets better. Again, can you imagine a non-drug way to like dramatically change your life? I mean, who wouldn't want that first, right? That's what would be my first choice because the side of profile that is actually zero. <laughs> that's, that's the number, that's what you want to look at, right? That's to so me, great to hear. Yeah, um, everything's about risk benefit. I would always choose technologies and practices that have a risk of zero over anything else. It's, Dr. Berkowitz, I don't know how much time we have left, but um, I have as I, much time as you need. Okay, I just heard I just heard you speak a lot about uh, vitamin C and vitamin D pertaining to COVID nineteen. However, can we go a little bit into vitamins with the hypoglycemic or the diabetic or sure. any of the blood sugar irregularities? Uh, do you have something um, you know that you would suggest? I do have a whole chapter on it, and if anybody's hearing this, I want them to be aware. Please don't take anything indiscriminately, you know, um, so. And one of the things I always think about is treat almost supplements as medication, right? It's part of your medication toolkit, because right. things interact with each other. So I'll talk about a couple of ones I use in practice. One of the ones I always think about first is chromium. So chromium is really interesting. Chromium's job in the body is actually to metabolize glucose. You actually need chromium to do that effectively. On, on average, to, uh, you need 100 micrograms of chromium to probably process 100 grams of glucose. So that's a direct one. You mentioned vitamin D. Vitamin D has a tremendous role on insulin sensitivity, that people with low vitamin D levels have a lot more issues with insulin resistance. There is a direct correlation with that. My favorite one, and I have a colleague who's a naturopathic doctor who talks about magnesium being her next husband. Um, magnesium is so critical in so many, I mean, we use it at night to help us relax. It really helps with blood sugar you know, regulation. But where it really helps is actually for the heart disease risk. We know from studies that magnesium is a very effective tool to prevent heart disease, right? Uh, some studies that were done in Honolulu and Hawaii showed that it can reduce that risk up to 50%, which is tremendous. It actually acts as what we call a vasodilator, helping blood sugar control and blood pressure control. Actually, let me go back to vitamin D. There's some recent studies that have come out about vitamin D showing that it actually has a great role in actually controlling blood pressure. So from the COVID-19 studies, interesting enough, we came out that it works on what we call the renin-angiotensin system, which is, if you look at people taking drugs for hypertension or for diabetes, prevention, vitamin D works on that cascade. So having adequate vitamin D levels are really essential from that aspect. Other things that make a difference are things like omega-3s. The impact on inflammation is very critical. Uh, alpha lipoic acid is used a lot. That's actually even more critical in people that develop neuropathy symptoms. And actually, I want to take a step back about that. So in my diabetics, what's interesting is I oftentimes see more complications when they have low blood sugar sometimes where I have a gentleman who's in his 80s and we have this conversation, whenever his A1C, which is your three month average of blood sugar, drops below five. And the normal range is for most people is about five to 5.4 or 5.5. He has more protein in the urine. He has more neurological symptoms. So low blood sugar can be important to that. And things like alpha lipoic acid can help that. And acetylcysteine is another one we use oftentimes to have an effect. Um, B vitamins have a big effect, especially B12 and folic acid in, in helping glucose 
sensitivity. I mean, there's so many things you can do, but again, two really important things is you want to take things for reason and that one impacts the other. For example, people that take high doses of vitamin D may need vitamin A and vitamin K because those are important as well, that taking too much of one thing without the proper ratio can be problematic. We, one of our colleagues, uh, Julia Ross, you may be familiar with her work. She's focused a lot on amino acids. Uh, one thing she, you know, I, you mentioned that, you know, choosing strategies which you know are safe. And uh, clearly, uh, I mean, it, it seems clear from her work that amino acids have been a very safe course of treatment. But the issue is you're saying where to target those amino acids and how much to take uh, sure. where you can actually correct the adrenal imbalance versus uh, taking uh, small amounts. And I think that also applies to vitamin C and vitamin B. I, I've been fascinated with the well, work you've been doing with other doctors about how to, the protocols for treating COVID-19 and how, you know, uh, you know, people may be already taking vitamin C, but they may not be taking it uh, or vitamin D in the quantities that they need to, to really um, battle the, the virus. So I'll talk about vitamin C. I think it's so interesting. So if you look at the research on vitamin C, there was a lot of good research coming out of Europe that they showed in people with viral infections when they ended up in the intensive care unit or very sick, one of the things they noticed is they had low levels of vitamin C. Vitamin C is really fascinating. It is, it's what we call a vasopressor. What that means is it helps the body deal with stress. So I, I, everyone's heard about people being sick in the ICU with something called septic shock. So septic shock is when an infection overwhelms the system and your body can't maintain your blood pressure. One of those mechanisms to fight that off is actually vitamin C. And we actually have learned in COVID-19, I'm part of a group uh, and of 11 physicians, you know, including five very prominent critical care specialists that have you know, looked at a protocol we call Math Plus based on the work of Dr. Paul Marek out of East Virginia Medical Center a very big expert in critical care and septic shock, looking at ways to prevent that inflammatory process. And the combination of, and this is obviously in hospital, is a vitamin C, steroid, thiamine, and sometimes heparin to fight off the hypochromical state, when given early in an admission to the hospital in people that are sick, really can make a difference in mortality and morbidity. And actually Houston and my colleague, Dr. Verone, who's been on TV all this week, he's now a big celebrity star on MSNBC and CNN, he's seen a reduction and success rate of 96% in his patients, where mortality rates have really dropped dramatically, and the need for ventilator use has gone down tremendously. So again, our body needs these basic elements to really function. And again, two of the protocols, parts of Math Plus, and now vitamin D is part of that as well, are natural things, thiamine, which is vitamin B1, and vitamin C. And, and again, steroids, what also happens as well is steroids, interesting enough, and again, they should not be used at home during the early part of the virus because they can actually make what we call viral replication worse, right? You don't want to take things that in, in, enhance the amount of virus. It's really only used in the later inflammatory stage. Our work together synergistically and really effective. And the good news is it's very inexpensive. <laughs> So things and, like prednisone is what you're talking about. And, and the type we use is something called methylprednisone. And the reason we use that, and I, I don't know if people read, there was a study out of Oxford called the recovery trial, where they talked about dexamethasone. The reason we use methylprednisone is one of my colleagues, uh, Umberto Maduri from Tennessee, who I would call the world's expert on prednisone or glucocorticoids, which is the class, talks about the fact that methylprednisone gets much higher concentrations into the lungs than dexamethasone, so it's actually much more effective. Well, I, I know that we could continue this conversation for at least another hour, and what we'd like to do actually is invite you back for uh, hopefully at least a few conversations or keep the conversation going. Um, you, you do have a website, and please share that again. Let, so people, if they do have questions, uh, you probably have a Facebook page, and. I realize that as a practicing doctor, you can't respond to everybody who reaches out to you, but how do people contact you and find out more? And um, we're hoping that very much that you'll be willing to uh, chat with us again and continue the conversation, maybe drill into, I feel like we could spend a whole hour just talking about supplements, amino acids, <laughs> and vitamins, et cetera. Uh, or we could talk about um, thyroid 
for uh, you know another hour. And so we'd love to come back and continue the conversation. And maybe we should talk about next time digestion and the role of digestion in hypoglycemia. That's another big one. So my website is uh, www.centerforbalancedhealth.com. I also, you know, not as good as my kids, but I do have an Instagram and I do every Wednesday an Instagram live and it's Dr. Dr. Keith Berkowitz. And every Wednesday at 2 p.m. we do an Instagram live. The last couple have been um, last week, uh, two days ago was on polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is another pre-diabetic condition. And the week before was on thyroid and reactive hypoglycemia. So we've done those topics more recently. And then actually next week, we're going to talk about adrenal fatigue on Wednesday. We have shared the uh, protocol information that you've been sharing about the uh, COVID-19 on our website. Is that our links to that information also on your uh, Center for Balanced Health website? I'm not sure there's a link, but if you go to COVID19criticalcare.com, you'll be able to link, and there's a Facebook page along with that. That you know, And if you go to the website, the protocol can be downloaded. The research also behind the protocol is there as well. And, and we're learning, actually, interesting enough, we've had contact from physicians in Afghanistan, in Peru, in Mexico, in Spain, in Italy, Saudi Arabia, around the world that have been using the protocol effectively, and we're trying to really spread that message you know, to say things that are relatively safe with low risk could make a big difference in, in people's survival from COVID-19. We are so blessed to have you as an advisor to the Hypoglycemia Support Foundation and, um, to, to, and, and to know that there's a doctor out there who really understands hypoglycemia and all of its forms. And Well, well I have to, right? I have it. <laughs> so, can I tell my quick story about how I know about this? Please do. That'd be a great story. place to end. Because, so, I remember going back to medical school, and this is, oh my God, mid-90s, I guess. And I would be up at night studying for tests. So, the night before, I would have the family size package of Twizzlers. Clearly not, you know, a healthy food. And then the next morning, I would have to have this big cup of coffee, and we would have four-hour exams. I remember to make it through that four-hour exam, I would actually go through 20 to 30 hard candies. And then afterwards, I would have to have some kind of alcohol to wind myself down. So it was so hyper to make it through that process. And what I realized is that my blood sugar was going up and down a lot. And I, I, I didn't really understand what that meant until really into my 30s when I started working with Dr. Atkins and understanding what that meant, what reactive hypoglycemia. And I want to end on this thought. One of the problems with it, and I think all our frustrations, is there's really no guidelines out there for reactive hypoglycemia. Even though there is even coding for diagnosis, there really hasn't been published official guidelines to make that diagnosis. And I think that's one of the issues we feel. Because of that, a lot of health professionals don't know it as a disorder, don't realize that this is another pre-diabetic disorder that puts our body at risk for other things because there's no guidelines to make a diagnosis. There's no official guidelines out there. Maybe that's a project that we can work on together because I think we, we know we have a wonderful circle of physicians who are also, uh, you know, they're clinicians and researchers, and uh, that, that's a topic I think we've talked about before. I'd love to take that forward and um, make that happen. So, again, um, we're so appreciative. Roberta, I don't know if you have any closing words, but I know we're just uh, always just so grateful for your expertise and time. Oh, with, with pleasure. I can't wait um, to do another well, a couple of, of um, programs like this, because I want to get more into how you dealt with hypoglycemia personally, how you deal with it today, and I want to hear about... Oh, how- oh, by the way, what I did in medical school was not the right treatment. <laughs> <laughs> and, I want to hear about your work with, and I want to hear about your work with Dr. Atkins. I'm very excited to hear about that, because, you know, we corresponded with him. Uh, so um, I'm very, very excited. And can, can I end with one more comment, if you don't mind? Please. Sure. So, I, I, and this is for people, and I think this is really important, is if you have symptoms, it's your body, and you have to be confident in those are real. And no one else can tell you what you feel except for yourself, because no one else is there. So I think it's really critical that you're able to express that. And what I find before seeing a doctor, what's really helpful is write it down. Keep it, like uh, Roberta was saying before, keep a journal or write it down so that you feel confident when you're in that meeting that you can convey that. And that's really important is 
numbers are nice and blood tests are great, but the real key at the end of the day is you got to feel good. And, and I've always learned when you feel good, the numbers come along with that. But again, that's really the ultimate goal. Numbers are secondary. And, and don't, I always find, and I teach people, you have to be your own advocate first. You have to be your own prepared. Think of almost like a lawyer going to the court. You have to bring your argument in before to show, hey, this is what I have. This is the workup I need. And make, become a partner to your health professional. By becoming a partner to that, him and her, you become much more effective and you get better care. That's such great advice and such a wonderful place to end this conversation. And we look forward to more conversations. In the meantime, thank you for pointing to your Instagram uh, site. And uh, we'll, we'll certainly be the first to promote your book as soon as you announce a publishing <laughs> date. Um, we're excited to hear about that. And thank you once again for joining us. Oh, thank you so much. And uh, please Take be care. safe, everybody. All right. Bye now. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.